Section 19 of Winesburg, Ohio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Winesburg, Ohio by Sherwood Anderson. Section 19 An Awakening. Belle Carpenter had a dark skin, gray eyes, and thick lips. She was tall and strong. When black thoughts visited her, she grew angry, and wished she were a man and could fight someone with her fists. She worked in the millinery shop kept by Mrs. Kate McHugh, and during the day sat trimming hats by a window at the rear of the store. She was the daughter of Henry Carpenter, bookkeeper in the First National Bank of Winesburg, and lived with him in a gloomy old house far out at the end of Buckeye Street. The house was surrounded by pine trees, and there was no grass beneath the trees. A rusty tin eaves trough had slipped from its fastenings at the back of the house, and when the wind blew it beat against the roof of a small shed, making a dismal drumming noise that sometimes persisted all through the night. When she was a young girl, Henry Carpenter made life almost unbearable for Belle, but as she emerged from girlhood into womanhood he lost his power over her. The bookkeeper's life was made up of innumerable little pettinesses. When he went to the bank in the morning he stepped into a closet and put on a black alpaca coat that had become shabby with age. At night, when he returned to his home, he donned another black alpaca coat. Every evening he pressed the clothes worn in the streets. He had invented an arrangement of boards for the purpose. The trousers to his street suit were placed between the boards, and the boards were clamped together with heavy screws. In the morning he wiped the boards with a damp cloth and stood them upright behind the dining-room door. If they were moved during the day, he was speechless with anger, and did not recover his equilibrium for a week. The bank cashier was a little bully, and was afraid of his daughter. She, he realized, knew the story of his brutal treatment of her mother, and hated him for it. One day she went home at noon, and carried a handful of soft mud, taken from the road, into the house. With the mud, she smeared the face of the boards used for the pressing of trousers, and then went back to her work, feeling relieved and happy. Belle Carpenter occasionally walked out in the evening with George Willard. Secretly she loved another man, but her love affair, about which no one knew, caused her much anxiety. She was in love with Ed Hanby, bartender in Ed Griffith's saloon, and went about with the young reporter as a kind of relief to her feelings. She did not think that her station in life would permit her to be seen in the company of the bartender, and walked about under the trees with George Willard, and let him kiss her to relieve a longing that was very insistent in her nature. She felt that she could keep the younger man within bounds. About Ed Hanby she was somewhat uncertain. Hanby, the bartender, was a tall, broad-shouldered man of thirty, who lived in a room upstairs above Griffith's saloon. His fists were large and his eyes unusually small, but his voice, as though striving to conceal the power back of his fists, was soft and quiet. At twenty-five the bartender had inherited a large farm from an uncle in Indiana, when sold, the farm brought in eight thousand dollars, which Ed spent in six months. Going to Sandusky, on Lake Erie, he began an orgy of dissipation, the story of which afterward filled his home town with awe. Here and there he went, throwing the money about, driving carriages through the streets, giving wine parties to crowds of men and women, playing cards for high stakes, and keeping mistresses whose wardrobes cost him hundreds of dollars. One night at a resort called Cedar Point, he got into a fight and ran amuck like a wild thing. With his fist he broke a large mirror in the washroom of a hotel, and later went about smashing windows and breaking chairs in dance halls for the joy of hearing the glass rattle on the floor and seeing the terror in the eyes of clerks who had come from Sandusky to spend the evening at the resort with their sweethearts. The affair between Ed Hanby and Bell Carpenter on the surface amounted to nothing. He had succeeded in spending but one evening in her company. On that evening he hired a horse and buggy at Wesley Moyer's livery barn and took her for a drive. The conviction that she was the woman of his nature demanded that he must get her settled upon him, and he told her of his desires. The bartender was ready to marry and to begin trying to earn money for the support of his wife, but so simple was his nature that he found it difficult to explain his intentions. His body ached with physical longing, and with his body he expressed himself. Taking the milliner into his arms and holding her tightly in spite of her struggles, he kissed her until she became helpless. Then he brought her back to town and led her out of the buggy. "'When I get hold of you again, I'll not let you go. 
"'You can't play with me,' he declared as he turned to drive away. Then, jumping out of the buggy, he gripped her shoulders with his strong hands. "'I'll keep you for good the next time,' he said. "'You might as well make up your mind to that. It's you and me for it, and I'm going to have you before I get through.' One night in January, when there was a new moon, George Willard, who was in Ed Hanby's mind the only obstacle to his getting Bell Carpenter, went for a walk. Early that evening George went into Ransom Surbuck's pool-room with Seth Richard and Art Wilson, son of the town butcher. Seth Richmond stood with his back against the wall and remained silent, but George Willard talked. The pool-room was filled with Winesburg boys, and they talked of women. The young reporter got into that vein. He said that women should look out for themselves, that the fellow who went out with a girl was not responsible for what happened. As he talked, he looked about, eager for attention. He held the floor for five minutes, and then Art Wilson began to talk. Art was learning the barber's trade in Cal Prouse's shop, and already began to consider himself an authority in such matters as baseball, horse racing, drinking, and going about with women. He began to tell of a night when he, with two men from Winesburg, went into a house of prostitution at the county seat. The butcher's son held a cigar in the side of his mouth, and as he talked, spat on the floor. The women in the place couldn't embarrass me, though they tried hard enough, he boasted. One of the girls in the house tried to get fresh, but I fooled her. As soon as she began to talk, I went and sat in her lap. Everyone in the room laughed when I kissed her. I taught her to let me alone. George Willard went out of the pool room and into Main Street. For days the weather had been bitter cold with a high wind blowing down on the town from Lake Erie, eighteen miles to the north. But on that night the wind had died away, and a new moon made the night unusually lovely. Without thinking where he was going or what he wanted to do, George went out of Main Street and began walking in dimly lighted streets filled with frame houses. Out of doors under the black sky filled with stars, he forgot his companions of the pool room. Because it was dark and he was alone, he began to talk aloud. In a spirit of play, he reeled along the street, imitating a drunken man, and then imagined himself a soldier clad in shining boots that reached to the knees and wearing a sword that jingled as he walked. As a soldier, he pictured himself as an inspector, passing before a long line of men who stood at attention. He began to examine the accoutrements of the men. Before a tree he stopped and began to scold. "'Your pack is not in order,' he said sharply. "'How many times will I have to speak of this matter? Everything must be in order here. We have a difficult task before us, and no difficult task can be done without order.' Hypnotized by his own words, the young man stumbled along the board sidewalk, saying more words. "'There is a law for armies, and for men, too,' he muttered, lost in reflection. "'The law begins with little things, and spreads out until it covers everything. In every little thing there must be order, in the place where men work, in their clothes, in their thoughts. I myself must be orderly. I must learn that law. I must get myself into touch with something orderly and big that swings through the night like a star. In my little way I must begin to learn something, to give and swing and work with life, with the law.' George Willard stopped by a picket fence near a street lamp, and his body began to tremble. He had never before thought such thoughts as had just come into his head, and he wondered where they had come from. For the moment it seemed to him that some voice outside of himself had been talking as he walked. He was amazed and delighted with his own mind, and when he walked on again spoke of the matter with fervor. "'To come out of Ransom Surbeck's pool-room and think things like that,' he whispered, "'it is better to be alone.' If I talked like Art Wilson, the boys would understand me, but they wouldn't understand what I've been thinking down here. In Winesburg, as in all Ohio towns of twenty years ago, there was a section in which lived day laborers. As the time of factories had not yet come, the laborers worked in the fields or were section hands on the railroads. They worked twelve hours a day and received one dollar for the long day of toil. The houses in which they lived were small, cheaply constructed wooden affairs, with a garden at the back. The more comfortable among them kept cows and perhaps a pig, housed in a little shed at the rear of the garden. With his head filled with resounding thoughts, George Willard walked into such a street on the clear January night. The street was dimly lighted, and in places there was no sidewalk. In the scene that lay about him there was something that excited his already aroused fancy. For a year he had been devoting all of his odd moments to the reading of books, and now some tale he had read concerning life in old-world towns of the Middle Ages came sharply back to his mind, so that he stumbled forward with the curious feeling of one revisiting a place that had been part of some former existence. 
On an impulse, he turned out of the street and went into a little dark alleyway behind the sheds in which lived the cows and pigs. For half an hour he stayed in the alleyway, smelling the strong smell of animals, too closely housed, and letting his mind play with the strange new thoughts that came to him. The very rankness of the smell of manure in the clear sweet air awoke something heady in his brain. The poor little houses lighted by kerosene lamps, the smoke from the chimneys mounting straight up into the clear air, the grunting of pigs, the women clad in cheap calico dresses and washing dishes in the kitchens, the footsteps of men coming out of the houses and going off to the stores and saloons of Main Street, the dogs barking and the children crying. All of these things made him seem, as he lurked in the darkness, oddly detached and apart from all life. The excited young man, unable to bear the weight of his own thoughts, began to move cautiously along the alleyway. A dog attacked him and had to be driven away with stones, and a man appeared at the door of one of the houses and swore at the dog. George went into a vacant lot, and throwing back his head, looked up at the sky. He felt unutterably big and remade by the simple experience through which he had been passing, and in a kind of fervor of emotion put up his hands, thrusting them into the darkness above his head and muttering words. The desire to say words overcame him, and he said words without meaning, rolling them over on his tongue and saying them because they were brave words, full of meaning. Death, he muttered, night, the sea, fear, loveliness. George Willard came out of the vacant lot and stood again on the sidewalk facing the houses. He felt that all of the people in the little street must be brothers and sisters to him, and he wished he had the courage to call them out of their houses and to shake their hands. If there were only a woman here, I would take hold of her hand, and we would run until we were both tired out, he thought. That would make me feel better. With the thought of a woman in his mind, he walked out of the street and went toward the house where Belle Carpenter lived. He thought she would understand his mood, and that he could achieve in her presence a position he had long been wanting to achieve. In the past, when he had been with her and had kissed her lips, he had come away filled with anger at himself. He had felt like one being used for some obscure purpose, and had not enjoyed the feeling. Now he thought he had suddenly become too big to be used. When George got to Bell Carpenter's house, there had already been a visitor there before him. Ed Hanby had come to the door, and calling Bell out of the house, had tried to talk to her. He had wanted to ask the woman to come away with him and to be his wife, but when she came and stood by the door, he lost his self-assurance and became sullen. "'You stay away from that kid,' he growled, thinking of George Willard, and then, not knowing what else to say, turned to go away. "'If I catch you together, I will break your bones and his too,' he added. The bartender had come to woo, not to threaten, and was angry with himself because of his failure. When her lover had departed, Belle went indoors and ran hurriedly upstairs. From a window at the upper part of the house she saw Ed Hanby cross the street and sit down on a horse-block before the house of a neighbor. In the dim light the man sat motionless, holding his head in his hands. She was made happy by the sight and when George Willard came to the door, she greeted him effusively and hurriedly put on her hat. She thought that, as she walked through the streets with young Willard, Ed Hanby would follow, and she wanted to make him suffer. For an hour, Bell Carpenter and the young reporter walked about under the trees in the sweet night air. George Willard was full of big words. The sense of power that had come to him during the hour in the darkness in the alleyway remained with him and he talked boldly, swaggering along and swinging his arms about. He wanted to make Bell Carpenter realize that he was aware of his former weakness, and that he had changed. "'You'll find me different,' he declared, thrusting his hands into his pockets and looking boldly into her eyes. "'I don't know why, but it is so. You've got to take me for a man, or let me alone. That's how it is.' Up and down the quiet streets under the new moon went the woman and the boy. When George had finished talking, they turned down a side street and went across a bridge into a path that ran up the side of a hill. The hill began at Waterworks Pond and climbed upward to the Winesburg fairgrounds. On the hillside grew dense bushes and small trees, and among the bushes were little open spaces carpeted with long grass, now stiff and frozen. As he walked behind the woman up the hill, George Willard's heart began to beat rapidly and his shoulders straightened. Suddenly he decided that Belle Carpenter was about to surrender herself to him. The new force that had manifested itself in him had, he felt, been at work upon her and had led to her conquest. 
the thought made him half drunk with the sense of masculine power. Although he had been annoyed that as they walked about she had not seemed to be listening to his words, the fact that she had accompanied him to this place took all his doubts away. It is different. Everything has become different, he thought, and taking hold of her shoulder turned her about and stood looking at her, his eyes shining with pride. Bell Carpenter did not resist. When he kissed her upon the lips, she leaned heavily against him and looked over his shoulder into the darkness. In her whole attitude there was a suggestion of waiting. Again, as in the alleyway, George Willard's mind ran off into words, and holding the woman tightly, he whispered the words into the still night. Lust, he whispered, lust and night and women. George Willard did not understand what happened to him that night on the hillside. Later, when he got to his own room, he wanted to weep, and then grew half insane with anger and hate. He hated Belle Carpenter, and was sure that all his life he would continue to hate her. On the hillside he had led the woman to one of the little open spaces among the bushes, and had dropped to his knees beside her. As in the vacant lot by the laborer's houses, he had put up his hands in gratitude for the new power in himself, and was waiting for the woman to speak, when Ed Hanby appeared. The bartender did not want to beat the boy who he thought had tried to take his woman away. He knew that beating was unnecessary, that he had power within himself to accomplish his purpose without using his fists. Gripping George by the shoulder and pulling him to his feet, he held him with one hand while he looked at Bell Carpenter, seated on the grass. Then, with a quick, wide movement of his arm, he sent the younger man sprawling away into the bushes and began to bully the woman who had risen to her feet. "'You're no good,' he said roughly. "'I've half a mind not to bother with you. I'd let you alone if I didn't want you so much.' On his hands and knees in the bushes, George Willard stared at the scene before him, and tried hard to think. He prepared to spring at the man who had humiliated him. To be beaten seemed to be infinitely better than to be thus hurled ignominiously aside. Three times the young reporter sprang at Ed Hanby, and each time the bartender, catching him by the shoulder, hurled him back into the bushes. The older man seemed prepared to keep the exercise going indefinitely, but George Willard's head struck the root of a tree, and he lay still. Then Ed Hanby took Bell Carpenter by the arm and marched her away. George heard the man and woman making their way through the bushes. As he crept down the hillside, his heart was sick within him. He hated himself, and he hated the fate that had brought about his humiliation. When his mind went back to the hour alone in the alleyway, he was puzzled, and stopping in the darkness listened, hoping to hear again the voice outside himself that had so short a time before put new courage into his heart. When his way homeward led him again into the street of frame houses, he could not bear the sight, and began to run, wanting to get quickly out of the neighborhood that now seemed to him utterly squalid and commonplace. End of section 19